Okay, I'm going to ask you what may sound like a terribly irreverent question. Jesus gave his life for the world. Does it really matter? And I think what um, provokes the message today is the repeated reference to sacrifice that you hear on a weekend like this weekend and, and a holiday like Memorial Day. Giving your life, sacrificing your all, setting yourself aside for other people. And what I'd like to do is look at that question and ask that question from the pages of Scripture. Jesus gave his life for the world, so what? What does it matter? So look at Isaiah 53, which we read together earlier. So there in the Old Testament, the great prophet Isaiah, who constantly refers to the coming of the Messiah and also the coming of the new heavens and the new earth, <coughs> probably more of that is concentrated in Isaiah than is dispersed throughout the whole Old Testament about coming of the Messiah. But particularly Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 6. So you say, Jesus died for me. And I say, why does it matter? What is it about Jesus dying for you or anybody else that's so important or so significant? Why is it every week we come together because of somebody who died for us? Why is it that all over the world there are people that are leaving whatever their faith is, whatever their beliefs are, their unbelief, and they're, they're coming to Jesus Christ when they discover that Jesus Christ died for them? So part of the answer is right here, Isaiah 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. This is written about 800 years before Jesus Christ came. And it's describing how people thought of Jesus when he came. And you could say, well, where's that in the Bible? Read the Gospel of John. Just read through the Gospel of John and find the conflict between Jesus and the leaders. They came at him again and again and again. And remember, when they arrested him, his own people, they spit on him, they slapped him around, they mocked him, they said uh, they blindfolded him, and they said, uh, if you're such a great prophet of God, who just smacked you upside your head? If you're really a prophet, you can tell. And then the most cruel and the most despicable form of execution was the cross. Now, verse 4. Surely, now, verse 3 is, look at how human beings treated him, what they thought of him, but here's the truth about him. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. What that means is God sent Jesus to die for our sins. We looked at him and said, that guy was a fraud and an imposter, and he deserved to be killed. He deserved to die. But when your eyes are opened and you see Jesus with eyes of grace, then you start to say, surely he has borne my griefs He's carried my sorrows, and yes, he was stricken by God, but because I deserve to be stricken by God. Verse uh, 5 takes it further. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or punishment for our peace was upon him. What that means is that in order for you and I to have peace with God, so that your sins are forgiven and you will be a friend of God, a son or a daughter of God, rather than under the wrath of God. Jesus took the wrath of God, the chastisement of God, and then we have peace with God instead of war. And then he goes on and he says, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, a lot of people think they find atonement or healing in the atonement with that. I think... The primary emphasis in the clear context is 
that the breach between God and the sinner is healed by what Jesus Christ died for us. He came between God's wrath and your deserving it and suffered God's wrath in your place as your substitute and removed it from you. Even though none of us can plead holiness and righteousness and perfect obedience, we have to confess our sins. I don't care how prettily dressed anybody is. I don't care how good anybody looks to you. Any of the people that you admire, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there you go in verse um, 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Now, I don't know if there are any sheep herders among us today. But you got to keep your eye on sheep. They always think there's something better over there. Well, I don't want to be here. I want to be over there. The shepherd wants them to come together over here. Now, oh, no, I want to go there. I want to do it. Sounds just like you and me. And uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, now notice this, everyone to his own way. But here it is. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, on the great day of atonement, they would take, take two animals. One would be offered as a sacrifice on the altar. And the other one would be let go and would be let go to go wherever it wanted to go. And when you would bring an animal to sacrifice, you would put your hand on that animal's head, and that signified this animal is going to suffer what I deserve. And so the one animal suffered the wrath of God pictorially, and the other animal was gone. And that symbolized that God took your sins when Jesus died on the cross, and they're gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far has our God removed our transgressions from us. We may have been scarlet in our sin, but we are now washed whiter than snow. Because a perfect man who always existed as God Almighty, the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, was conceived in the virgin womb of Mary, grew up, never sinned, never deserved the cross, never deserved anything but God's full measure of love and delight. And instead, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was there in our place. And just by you trusting in God's word about God's son, God then confers upon you absolute forgiveness of your sins and the righteousness of the obedience of his son, Jesus Christ. It's as though you were like Jesus and lived your life without sin all your life. You get his reputation and he gets yours. And he died and that was it. And when he, when he was put in the tomb, your sins were put in there too and gone. And when he came out of the tomb, that's your new life. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that makes you and me born again. So you can see how great that is right there. Now, also take a look at a couple things Jesus says in John chapter 10 to round it out a little bit. John chapter 10. Now, you know, some chapters in the Bible are taken up with a main theme or topic, and this one is the chapter of the Good Shepherd. So John 10, whenever I think of the Good Shepherd, I'm grateful to remember John 10. Or if somebody says, let's turn to John 10, I think, oh, that's the Good Shepherd. Just like 1 Corinthians 15. Anybody know what that chapter is? Come on, 1 Corinthians 15. Resurrection, yes. 1 Corinthians 13, love chapter, right. But anyhow... You know, good thing you don't have to go to, you don't have to know certain verses and places where they are before you can go to heaven, right? <laughs> so John chapter 10, verse 11, though. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives us life for the sheep. See it? In simple words, Jesus takes Isaiah 53 and says, that's who I am. 
Usually the sheep are taken care of by the shepherd, and the sheep get sacrificed. Here the shepherd gets sacrificed for the sheep. See, when you're walking around on the hallowed ground of the new heavens and the new earth, you will walk around in amazement and wonder and gratitude saying, I'm here. I don't deserve to be here. But I'm here because of Jesus, the lamb slain. That's why I'm here. If you think that you're going to say anything else than that, you're in deep trouble. If you think you're going to be walking around in the new heavens and the new earth saying, I deserve this. Remember what I did for you? Remember I helped that little old lady cross the street? You didn't forget. And I wouldn't have let you forget either. No. Humble, grateful, overawed hearts. We'll be walking around saying, I'm, I'm here, but what I really deserve is, you know? So I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives us life for the sheep. Plus, if you struggle with assurance, if you struggle with that, what's going to happen when I die? I believe in Jesus, but simple verse. I am the good shepherd. Do you believe that? The good shepherd gives us life for the sheep. Are you a sheep? Are you ready and willing to admit, yeah, I go astray? And not just BC. You still go astray too many times. I still go astray too many times. We're not saved because he saves us out of our miserable, wretched condition, and then we keep our noses clean for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, then we can go to heaven. You need forgiveness every day. He's still the good shepherd, and he still gave his life for the sheep every day. Hallelujah. But then there's chapter 15. Look at these words. He starts uh, at verse 11. And, and notice, if you have a red letter Bible, now let me say this. The red letters, the words in the red letters, are no more authoritative than the ones in the black letters. This is all the word of God. Every word in it. Okay? Just keep that in mind. The red letters are a help that the translators and the publishers provide so that you can see what the translators believe are the words that Jesus actually spoke. But all the Bible is the word of God. But look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Sometimes God's people forget this. The faith that God wants you to have is a joyful faith. And if you don't have a joyful faith, take some time praying about it, praying for it, and finding scriptures about it because it is Jesus' will for you to have a joyful faith. Not just to go on in life, grit and determination, and sometimes that's true. We were talking with Roseanne last night, and she says that at times that's what God gives her is grit and determination where she's going through Terrible suffering. But there's also joy. And we get it from Jesus himself. I want my joy to remain in you, and I want it to be full. Not a trickle, but full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. The friend of God. That's what Abraham was, remember? A friend of God. And then he says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, what did he command us? That we love one another as he loved us. Now, there's a lot of ideas out there in the world, different religions, different opinions. And, you know, but most people agree that love is a good thing. Now, maybe not love for your enemy, but love for those that love you, those, those, love for those that you like and they like you. Be that as it may, Jesus says, you're my friends. And then he talks about if you do whatever I command you. But what does he command us? Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the one that a lot of people, why is that in the Bible? Love your enemy. 
But I'm, you know, I'm really glad that I'm supposed to love my enemy because you know what? The Bible says that before Christ, I was God's enemy and Jesus loved me, his enemy. And the way I lived my life, now I didn't know it at the time. I didn't think at the time. I, I justified everything I did pretty much. Well, a couple things I'd have to say. That's when I started to come to Christ is when I did some stuff that I myself could not justify and that kind of bothered me. You ever hear of a guilty conscience? You know, sometimes a guilty conscience, probably more times than we like to admit, is a good thing. Because in a lot of cases, the reason you have a guilty conscience is because somebody other than yourself is talking to you. Because I can, I can do a great job of getting rid of my guilty conscience. But sometimes I can't get rid of it. And I know it's not Steve Dyson, somebody else. Not my wife, somebody else. And it's the Holy Spirit saying, that wasn't right. I don't care what you say. That wasn't right. Go and make it right. I don't want to do that. But there's this other person in your life. Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And that's why when we take our right turns and our left turns or head back to the other direction, he's faithful and he will turn us back into the path because he loves us before we even loved him. But there you have another one. Now you all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, okay. Let me look just before we finish Romans chapter 5. Because <coughs> you might be with me right now. But I wonder if you're going to be with me when you read this. Now, of course, not with me. Who am I? I'm no big deal. I'm nothing. But this is God's word. And so when I say you're with me, what, I'm, what I really mean is that you're believing what we're seeing in Scripture. You're putting your faith in Christ. You're accepting this. This is the truth, no matter how unflattering and uncomplimentary it is to you personally or me personally. So in Romans chapter 5, which we had read to us today, Verse 6, for when we were still without strength in due time or at the time set by God in eternity past, you could actually paraphrase it that way, Christ died for the ungodly. Are you willing to own that and say, yep, I'm ungodly? And then he says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Now, what's that mean? I think it means something like this. Do you have, have you ever met somebody who really knows what they're talking about? You wish they didn't, but they really know what they're talking about. They're good at what they do, and they let everybody know. They're righteous. Not only are they really righteous, but... They want everybody to admit they're righteous. And you desperately wish, I wish I could catch this person in a fault, blemish, a mistake or something. Man, would I just rub it in their face. But you can't. And the time comes for you to die for that kind of person. Nope, not me. I think that's, that's close to what Paul's saying there. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man. Now, there would be somebody who's a good, a good guy, a good person, a good lady, a good woman. And then they help people, and they care about people, and they're humble, and, and, and they're not walking around like this. And that's a person, maybe I would take a bullet for them. But that's the point. In the next verse, it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners... Now, what was the word he just used before this? Ungodly, we were sinners, Christ died for us. What Paul is getting at is, this is unheard of. This doesn't happen in the religious world. This isn't how it works. Righteous people go to heaven. Ungodly people go to hell. Obedient people go to heaven. Sinners go to hell. And if you get that wrong, everything's wrong. You can't think like that. You can't be saying that. A lot of people hated Paul. That's what Paul thought before he got saved. 
We can't have these Christians running around, you're saved by grace. I have to go get them and I have to arrest them and we have to get rid of them until he got saved by grace. And if anybody had the right to say, I'm really righteous, it was the Apostle Paul. So he says in verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What is wrath? Wrath is God's just displeasure against everything that's wrong, everything that's evil, everything that ought not to be. It's not some crazy, furious storm that God unleashes on people every once in a while because he gets, he loses his mind. It is God's just displeasure, just like when somebody does something wrong to you or to somebody you love, you don't like it. In a pure way, without sin, that's God's wrath. So he saved us from wrath. Then verse 10, for if when we were enemies, see the heightened, ungodly, sinners, enemies, we were reconciled, made friends with God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And then here comes the joy again. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now, not future, now have received the reconciliation. All right. Jesus gave his life for the world Does it matter? Of course it does. In Islam, you might die for Allah, but it would never be the other way around. Never, ever, it wouldn't even enter into anybody's mind. In fact, that's one of the reasons why a devout Muslim really dislikes what we believe. That God died for us? Or Hindus, they have 330 million deities. You might make sacrifices to them, And they may kill you, but none of them would ever sacrifice itself for humans. And that's every religion. Go through them all. This is, to all other religions and religious people, this is absolutely upside down and backwards. That the God would die for the God's people. Mm -mm. So let me put it to you succinctly. The creator gave his life for the people he created. The judge takes off his judicial robes and takes the place of the criminals on the cross. That's the gospel. The lawgiver dies for those who broke his law. What about you? Have you ever been forgiven? Have you ever been forgiven your sins, all of your sins? Are you prepared to say, that's me, I'm ungodly. That's me, I'm a sinner. That's me. I don't like to admit it, but it seems like I have to, an enemy of God. Who wants to think like that? But let me make it clear how important this is, how significant it is that God himself would die for us, that really there's no other way for you and I to have any hope before God on the judgment day. Let me put it this way. Have you ever told a lie? Ever? Have you ever misrepresented the truth in any way whatsoever? I remember going home one night, and I was high, and my parents asked me about what was wrong, what was going on, and I told them about 45% of the truth, but I left out the other 55%, which would have gotten me in trouble. I was lying. Have you ever made fun of somebody? Have you ever looked down on anyone? Have you ever taken anything that didn't belong to you? For whatever reason, they don't need it. Oh, they have lots. They've got more money to know what to do with. Did you ever at any time in your life disobey your mom or your dad? See, this is very practical. Did you ever tell someone something bad about another person? Have you ever watched or looked at something you shouldn't have, but you did? Have you ever raised your voice against someone? Acted like you were right when you were wrong? Have you ever wanted something so much that you got angry or sad when you didn't get it? If you had to say yes to even one of these questions, you have broken the Ten Commandments. 
And I can't believe that there aren't a number of people in this room, and I love you, that had to say yes to a bunch of these. And where do you think I got these? A book of sermon convicting words. No. (laughs) Convicted me. So I ask you, have you ever been forgiven of all your sins? Because that's what Jesus is out to do. To forgive you of all your sins and make a new you. A new person out of you. Now listen, don't take it for granted. I think sometimes people are in a Christian milieu, a Christian atmosphere, a Christian associations and friends, maybe growing up in a Christian family. And yeah, I know Jesus died. Yeah, he paid for our sins. Yeah, we're forgiven. Uh, Have you ever asked God to forgive you your sins? Have you ever known the need to cry out to Jesus and ask forgiveness for your sins? That's what I'm asking. That's what I'm talking about. Don't assume it. Don't take it for granted. You might end up somewhere where you thought you would never be forever. So make this the day of salvation for you. Memorial Day would be a great day for it. As we remember those who sacrificed for us, for our freedoms, our way of life, remember him who sacrificed himself to save us from the very wrath of God and give us a new life that will last forever and ever and and never will get old. Hallelujah. Have you made Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior? Now you might say, I'm not sure. Well, how about right now, all of us will bow our heads in prayer, and those of you who have received forgiveness, give thanks and praise and rejoice. And those of you who are not sure, today, cry out to the Lord and say, this day, Memorial Day weekend, I want to ask you to forgive all of my sins. I come before you. I admit myself humbly to be ungodly, a sinner, even your enemy. Have mercy upon me and forgive me, O oh God, my sins through Jesus Christ in whom I now put my faith, my trust. I'll give you an opportunity for yourself to call upon the name of the Lord. If this is the day of salvation for you to look back on, but also to look forward to the rest of your life with God, day by day until forever, let somebody know that. Get the help that you need to grow. We all need help from others. And God saves us into a family, not as individuals by ourselves. Thank you, O Lord, our God. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ. Uh, What's that verse that your servant Paul said? Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.